What's the biggest piece of advice you would give to founders like raising in the current environment? Is it anything different than you would have told someone like a year ago? It is understanding money is where I'm moving now versus like three, four years ago, five years ago. I didn't understand money as much as I do now. Mm -hmm. So what I'll say is there is an unlimited unlimited i know this is crazy but there is an unlimited amount of money available unlimited is but Welcome to the Omni Show, where we bring you authentic insight into the world of finance, pop culture, tech, and business news. Our guest, Kayla Constanetta, embodies the spirit of innovation and community impact. Yes, she does. She is a visionary behind Agua, mm, Lord her mercy. She is the visionary behind Agua Bonita, a line of better for you Mexican drinks. Her mission is, is threefold, to create a product that's good for you, good for the planet, and good for the community, which she has done. Yes, I can't wait to talk about it. She has broken barriers as the first Latina in the in her industry to raise more than a million dollars, but she has also earned a coveted spot on the Forbes 30 to under 30 list, received a prestigious title of a Cartier Global Impact Entrepreneur, and has been named a Top 100 Female Founder by Inc. Magazine. Kayla's story doesn't end with her entrepreneur success. When she isn't working, you can find her cherishing moments with her newborn baby, reminding us all that even in the world of business, family remains at the heart of what truly matters. So welcome to the show, Kayla. Hi, hi. No, it's been so long since we've been able to catch up. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. You got a new baby? I do. Yeah, I just had I him feel a few like months you had ago. A I feel like you had a new baby when we met. I did, yeah. It oh, was, wow. Um, when we met, I had a little one. He was my nephew, though. Um, but I had okay. had him since he was, like, six weeks old. Um, yeah, and he was there, like, when I started growing the business and everything. Um, but this one is my first pregnancy. And, oh. yeah, I have been building our business like crazy, but also while being pregnant like heavily pregnant this last year. Well, congratulations. That's amazing. Thank I mean, when, when I started Black Girl Ventures, Skylar was one. Um, and yeah, so that that is amazing that you're like staying on top of it and rolling with it. And I, and I don't even want to, you know what, well, let me back up off of that because I think we say that to women, we don't say it to men. Um, and, uh, and we don't, we talk about it differently. But I think the toll on our bodies is worth um, is worth the reverence, you know, is worth the, like the being commended because the toll in our bodies is different from the toll on a men's body. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm, I having a one year old trying to build a whole brand and company was a lot. And, you know, but anyway, you got a baby, you rocking and rolling to that and you got a whole business brewing. <laughs> so, okay. So from the last time, so when I met you, I think you were, uh, you pitched our Nike competition. Mm -hmm. Then Nike came back and, and got you as a, as a, became a customer. Mm -hmm. So you were able to also supply that offset offsite. And I don't know if any relationship things continue from there, but, um, then you were just back. Like, it was like every other LinkedIn post was like, boom, <laughs> Forbes on the four, you know, 30 under 30, boom. You know, this, I was like over here cheering, like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> When you go through a period like that, of like that hardcore strong building and accolades every other month, and then you also got to build a business. Talk mm -hmm. to us about like how that all feels. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think as an entrepreneur, the highs feel really high and the lows feel really low. And I think that that's something that I always just tried to stay like grounded in was like when I would, you know, get this big accolade or have this big achievement to like go ahead and celebrate it. But also remember, like, there's still so much work to be done. And like an accolade is just an accolade at the end of the day. Um, like my, my, my goal still is like, okay, let's build a great business. And so I think it, it's been 
that has helped, I think, make some of the lows feel less low, you know, because it was like, it doesn't matter if I'm making some prestigious list today or if today I am forgotten by that same company. Like what I was doing on that day and what I'm doing today is still the same thing. I'm working towards building a good business. I love that. Um, Back in 2021, you mentioned in an interview that you see your company as the underdogs and that development Agua Bonita took an emotional toll. Do you still Mm -hmm. see yourself as an underdog now with where you are? And how did you how did you work on the emotional and mental health uh, pieces during the founding stages of your company? Yeah, I mean, we are still absolutely the underdogs. Um, You know, I get a lot of praise for like being the first Latina to raise more than a million dollars. But when when you put it in perspective, is that like in CPG food and beverage, like I was raising a million dollars while my like white male counterparts were raising seven million at the same stage you know and when you're building a brand and getting into these stores and stuff like that those dollars matter um and so yeah so even though it's a it's a great achievement comparatively it's still a huge gap you know and so we are definitely still the underdogs. We were the underdogs then, we're the underdogs now. And I mean, until I'm having conversations with like Coke and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper or something about acquisition, I will still consider ourselves to be underdogs. Um, And I think, you know, I'm still struggling with balancing the mental health part of the journey. Um, I think especially with um, pregnancy and a new baby, like in the mix, I think that that became a lot more difficult than even before. It was figuring out how to um, go about that, how to like try to balance it, how to um, figure out like what I needed as a person, not just as mm-hmm. like someone's boss or like a founder um, or even just as a mom, you know. So I'm I'm still working through that. I really appreciate that um, because, and thank you for sharing that because I think that's the, that's the real, real, that this is a roller coaster ride and it really is more about having a team, you know, like it's not about like, can you solve it all? Are you super empowered? Are you beating your chest, you know, every other day? It's really like some days like, Hey, we up, <laughs> we in the store, we got money. And the other days like, Oh my God, I have no idea how we're about to make this payroll. And I think that is a real experience that lots of business owners that are listening and there's lots of people who are thinking about getting into business either hear and get intimidated by or they like, yeah, I get it. High five. What are some of the elements that in those low lows, though, like what do you pull out? Like, are you like a song? Let me pull out my favorite song. I got like a ratchet uh, fundraising playlist myself. Okay, (laughs) But Uh, what are some of those things for you? You know, I mean, honestly, one of the best things to come out of this whole experience is like my other founder friends who like have gone through the exact same stuff, the exact same like BS, like I can call them and just like talk and they know exactly like where I'm coming from and they will just like hold that space for me. Um, But then they will also like help me try to find solutions for whatever I'm struggling with which I think is just like a part of an entrepreneur's personality is like, okay, let me try to solve this problem. Um, But I think it's just like so important just to have people that like let you complain, you know, and like let you just like have that moment of like pity, but then are there to be like, okay, now, you know, get yourself together. (laughs) Like, you know, all right. Like you, I heard you, I got it. I understand. But like, now let's, let's keep it moving, you know? So you pitched to Black Girl Ventures and tell us, tell people about it. It's been so long ago, right? But I would love you to tell people about your experience. Um, You know, we always, we always tell your story and gaining over 400 new customers, but that's us telling your story. And I would love like, even any behind the scenes or things you remember, com, you know, feedback or just the whole experience will love any reflections that you have. Yeah, I mean, um, the Black Girl Ventures and Nike pitch competition was like one of the first um, pitch competitions that I was doing. And 
I knew that like this was a legitimate way for me to like launch my idea into the world because I didn't have any money. You know, you get you get told all the time like to pull together a friends and family round and stuff like that. Like I would have if I could have, but I didn't have like friends and family to do this. So like pitch competitions was the next best thing for me. And so I think like I mean, not to say that anyone didn't take it very seriously, but I took it very seriously, you know, like from day one showing up, like, no, I know what I want to say. Like, let me take this feedback and implement it. And like, I'm going to catch you on the next practice. And, you know, we're going to, I'm going to get this right. Um, And so I think that that was like one of the biggest um, things. And, And also like, it was a great experience for us as a team with like, just promoting our ourselves like we hadn't ever really like promoted ourselves as heavily as we did in that time you know trying to like get more votes and stuff like that um and so like that was a really great good like first practice for us um and so those were the things that like really stood out for me about like the whole experience I appreciate that because one of the things that I think people uh now try to focus on is like they just want to get to the $10,000. And I'm like, hey, don't negate the opportunity to become a great fundraiser. Like, push yourself in ways that you wouldn't push yourself. And when people view you as being a part of a competition, which is one of the reasons why this has worked, is that people are like, ooh, I want you to win. So they're like, they're turned on by the competition. They're like more willing to work with you, give, respond than they would if you just like, hey, can you give me $5,000? I'm like, hey, what you need $5,000 for? What are you going to do? What does that yeah. mean? You know what I mean? So I think that like I try to make sure that founders understand like, hey, this is a fundraising opportunity and an opportunity for you to move or speak about yourself in ways that you haven't. So I really appreciate you sharing that. So, you know, speaking of like the whole like public voting and that kind of thing, let's talk about social media for a second. Do you believe that a social media following is a representation of how successful you are, why or why not? Um, our listeners are entrepreneurs and seem to focus on, uh, you know, love the likes and followers mm-hmm. because that's what I think some people are painting the picture that you need to have. But what are your thoughts on that? Um, no, I don't think that a huge following is necessarily like a mark of success. It can be. Um, but I think, you know, unless you are seeing like the conversions from that following, um, at like the same scale as, you know, as huge as that following is, then it doesn't really matter. There's so many ways to like game the social media system and like it, putting pretty photos up and all that kind of stuff is great. I mean, we put up a lot of very beautiful photos, um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, everything converts. And at the end of the day, like that's all that matters in a business. Like, does this convert into cash or does it not? Because if it isn't, um, then, you know, is it really like the best use of your time? And like, I know like myself, like my personal, like Instagram, I have less than 3000 followers probably. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm verified the people on my account, like really come through they have a sphere of influence of their own you know what i mean and so i mean i would take the three thousand very well connected very dedicated followers that i have over thirty thousand, you know kind of filler accounts any day 100 percent, and i love that because when you talk about sphere of influence and so i published a book um originate motivate innovate seven steps for building a billion dollar network And, you know, part of this journey for me is I've had people like people in media say to me, like, you know what? You're popping in real life, but like it just doesn't show in your follower account. And I'm like, yeah. So like if y'all are looking at my follower account for the reason that you rock with me, forget all of that. Right. Like this is in real life. We're making moves. That sphere of influence is great. You know, you mentioned that the most critical lesson you learned in your business was the lean into your network. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about like, how is your network different now than when you started and what kind of lessons learned do you have around like how you moved in gaining an actual network? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think when it comes to building a network, there's been a lot of people along my journey that have been super helpful and wanted to like contribute to the success of the company. Um, And then there's been a lot of people that just kind of like want to talk and chop it up and things like that. And which is all great. 
But I think, you know, at the end of the day, like as a founder, you have so much on your plate that sometimes you really got to like cut through the noise and like, and like figure out, you know, who really can help you get to the next step that you have in mind and not just like what you can get from them, but also like what you can give to them too. Um, and I think that that was like the biggest lesson that I learned was just that not everyone that I meet is going to impact us in the way that maybe they think that they can or or whatever. But um, I'm happy to have them in the network. But, you know, the folks that I'm really like building with, like, OK, how do we make this like mutually beneficial? Um, and I think my network now compared to then has been the reason for a lot of our success. Um, I think I had to learn the difference between like a mentor and a sponsor. A sponsor. So for anyone listening that doesn't know the difference, like the way that I look at it is like a mentor is someone that has been in your position before and can give you like advice on like how they navigated that during that time in their career and stuff like that, right? Like people that you can relate to. Um, a sponsor is someone like a mentor who's, you know, a few or many steps ahead of you, but they might not be able to relate to anything that you went through in your childhood or whatever, but they can like pull you up still, right? Like they can make the connections for you that you would otherwise not be able to make for yourself um, because they are so different usually. Um, And so like even just learning the difference between those two types of people was a big shift in like how I started to approach my network. Mm. If you're just tuning in, you um, you listen to the Omi Show, and I am chatting with Kayla Castaneda, the visionary behind Agua Bonita, uh, which is Agua Frescas, a, a, a spin on Agua Frescas, which is awesome, a healthy spin. Tell us where where are you where are you now with the company? What stores are you in? What like you know? Tell us a little bit about where things are now. Where can we go buy? Yeah, we've grown from about 200 stores to almost 2,000 stores. Um, wow. So you can find us. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we uh, we can get us uh, nationwide at Whole Foods. If you're in California, you can find us in Target in California, um, some Costco's, 7-Eleven. I mean, the best place to see where we're at near you is our website. We have a store locator. So if you just go to www.drinkaguabonita.com and type in your address or your zip code, you'll see the many, many stores around you that have our product. Look at that. Were you in any stores when I met you? No. (laughs) Wow. I'm so happy for you. You know, like that is... I mean, we could probably go a whole nother hour just on what it means to get into a store. Yeah. I feel like that's, what, yeah, it's a, it's a whole nother thing. And I think people, when we talk about buying black or buying, you know, Latina, like supporting entrepreneurs, I think, or like just supporting the products, it's like, Hey, go buy products for your whole cookout. Okay. Yeah. Because we need these products. <laughs> we need these products to move off the shelf. Like thanks yeah. for celebrating us getting into the store, but that's not enough. We in there, but now we need you to become customers and essentially become repeat customers Mm -hmm. of the products that we're building so that we can get these things off the shelf so that we can prove that this is something that needs to needs to move for Mm -hmm. sure. Exactly. When okay, we gotta go to a quick break, but when we come back, we're gonna switch to a different kind of segment. Uh, which is brand new, which is an Ask Omi segment. So we, I'm going to flip. I'm going to be in a hot seat, and Kayla's going to get to ask me whatever she wants to ask me. Um, this is going to be fun. I have no idea what the questions are, and it really doesn't matter from life to business. It could be anything. So y'all keep a lock right here. You listen to the Omi Show. We'll be right back after this. I'm here with Kayla Castaneda. We're going to go into the Ask Omi segment. Keep it locked right here. We'll be right back. And now our Ask Omi segment, okay? So you just had a chance to hear the remarkable journey of our guest, Kayla Concietta, and now it's time for Ask Omi, all right? We're turning the tables. I'm in a hot seat, and she gets to ask me whatever she wants to ask me. It can be personal. It can be about business. It can be about networking. It can be, remember that time you owed me $50? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Um, So you have the floor, Kayla. Okay. All right. I have a few questions. Um, 
So one of my big questions is, you know, it's been a long time since we've caught up. It's been a couple of years. Um, and actually, when I first met you, um, you were Shelly. And so I wanted you to, you know, describe and talk about like the evolution that you've had over the last three years. Like, how would you describe that? What's that been like for you? Ooh. I mean, so just the name change part, I'll speak to that and then I'll just say, well, okay, let's put it all together. So over the last three years, maybe even four years, so I practice a Yoruba a way of life tradition called Ifa. And when you enter into the tradition, you do an initial um, uh, sort of enlightenment piece. And in that, you get a new name. So I had the name Omilade Ifasoyo already, uh, which means, which the whole thing means she who wears a water crown. Like I already had that already, but I didn't change it. I was just like, okay, that's going to be my spiritual name. And that's where I'm at. You, you know, you, I'm sure you know this, but as a founder, you're constantly evolving. I'm mm -hmm. not the same leader that I was when I started. In fact, I probably was like really annoyed and irritated all the time. And like, <laughs> maybe not even being the best leader at some point. And then I've had to grow into what it has meant to manage people, work with people, have empathy. And I'm still a work in progress with that. Um, and I've had to grow into what it means to delegate, let go, remove myself, things like that. Uh, with that, though, I think people look at it when you're leading them, they're just like, oh, you're the boss. And that's the figure that they have of you. Whole time, you're going through an entire process of your own, right? Those highs and those lows that we talked about earlier in the show, those are spiritual moments. Uh, somebody said to me, if you want to get come get closer to God, become an entrepreneur. So I was <laughs> saying that like I've been going coming through clean clearing old thoughts and old energy constantly. You know, where have I been attached to some familial things that no longer serve me? Where I've been where have I been attached to trauma that I've gone through that that does not serve me anymore? Where like who am I? What do I want to be? How do I want to walk in the world? And it's a constant journey. What made me decide to change my name, though, officially was um, I came to the realization that I am not the person that my mother birthed. Mm -hmm. That, like, out of all the hardcore healing and work I've done on myself, I am not Shelly. Um, I'm not that person with those um, different attributes that I had before. I've become a new person. Um, I've become a different person. Even just my perspective is different. Um, and how I think about things is different. Some of that comes from where you level up and you go into other rooms of power and you really realize like, oh, what this really is. Like, oh, this is how y'all have been moving over here. Got it. Some of that is deeply spiritual. Um, and so Omi is short for Omi La De, which uh, is the water that clears the path to us is what it means, which is interesting because Shelly, Stands for like meadow on a ledge, you know what I mean? So like everything, <laughs> everything about these different names have come from like nature and path building and support for others. And I feel like that's me operating in my true full purpose as Omi. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's so true is like the, the evolution that some of us go through is so like stark um, that yeah, sometimes it really warrants a whole new like way of presenting yourself to the world. So yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, my my next question is more on the like investor side. The next couple ones, um, I wanted to know what are your thoughts on the fearless fund suit, and what do you think that means for diversity investing? Yeah, I think that it's tiring, it's exhausting, it's unfortunate. It feels like history repeating itself. It feels like it feels like being unsafe or not knowing where to feel safe. It feels like because I mean like this is um like you know, you you throwing a rock in a pond doesn't just it shifts the way the water moves. Right. No matter how small it is or, you know, how big it like it really shifts the way the water moves. Visually, you're looking at it, you're like, oh, it's, it's fine. You know, the water's still kicking. But really, this is this this could be 
Um, I, I feel like, you know, there's ways where there's a part of me that feels like this is equivalent to burning a cross on your yard. This is, hey, anybody working in diversity, equity, inclusion, we coming for y'all. And, you know, starting with the overturning of affirmative action, right? It's like, you know, then you have like the 8A program, been around for decades, the SBA 8A program, which helps uh, underrepresented or socially disadvantaged people get access to contracts. A white woman sued the 8A program saying that she didn't get a contract because she was white. And so, because this is historically set for people who are socially disadvantaged. And so they paused the 8A program paused the AA program and then said that people had to send letters and stories about how they had been socially disadvantaged. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me right now? You know what I mean? Like, this yeah. is just like, what are we doing? Where are we living? Like how, you know, I mean, yeah, just like, um, I, don't know, I think it's uh, Rashida Tlaib. I mean, I don't want to, I don't mm -hmm. want to mispronounce her name, but um, being, attempting to silence her in Congress right now. Like, where are we living? You know, I'm like, what are we? I, I, it just, it feels, yeah, Rashida Tlaib, it feels like we're really entering into a foreign place that doesn't quite focus on humanity as much as we said. Like, being American in any sense, whether it is, you know, immigrant, American, um, or born here is starting to shift what it means, mm -hmm. right? And I think that, like, we've had these these strong historical moments over time. Um, and now our our generation is now having to live through what that feels like now, right? Like, no, it, it, it's not what it looked like in the 50s, you know? It's not what it looked like during slavery, or slavery of course. But it is what it looks like for us right now and how we define that and speak to it and articulate it. So the long and the short of it is I feel like it is, it feels unfortunate and it feels safe and it feels like who's next. And it feels like, you know, we don't know what will be the final outcomes and what that means for that will have repercussions on everybody in the ecosystem serving underrepresented founders. It, it has that potential to have that mm -hmm. level of weight. Um, I think there's ways we can get strategic about it, smart about it, and things like that, right? But in language, it's tricky, right? Yeah. Um, our competition, the audience judges, and that could be anybody. Um, so our thesis is that we serve, you know, our mission is that we serve underrepresented founders. When it comes to choosing who gets the the funding from our pitch competitions, that's open to the public for for voting. So I don't know that that's enough to alleviate us of the of the threat, but I would say that like it does shift it for us in that way where we're saying like, hey, we're we're not saying that people can't participate, you know, we're just saying that the ways that we want to create better in the world, the, way, the you know, we're we're focused on a specific group, but I'm for all people, period. Yeah. Um, our mission focuses on a specific group, but yeah, it feels crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, with with that and just knowing, like, um, you know, just the way that things have shifted on the investment side, like, what's the biggest piece of advice you would give to founders, like, raising in the current environment? Is it anything different than you would have told someone, like, a year ago? It's, it is different from what I would have told someone a year ago just because I have more information now. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily because of what's happening in the market. I mean, the markets will dictate how people are uh treat their risk like whether or not they're risk averse we also know historically that people who are the most wealthy tend to make money when the markets are weird so mm -hmm. it, it is understanding money is where i'm moving now versus like three four years ago five years ago i didn't understand money as much as i do now mm -hmm. so what i'll say is there is an unlimited unlimited i know this is crazy but there is an unlimited amount of money available unlimited is but you have to learn how that money moves it doesn't move because you're great in terms of like oh my god great company like there's a layer of money that moves that way there's another layer of money that moves just because you're shaking hand and hands and kissing babies and you know you went to dinner with people and people uh, somebody told somebody about you like 
the whole like the the telephone game of who you are and how you move is of the utmost importance. Mm. So when you have partners, you want to you want to be responsive. You want to um, follow up well. You want to you know figure out your level of empathy and kindness, right? I'm not saying you got to kiss ass, but hell, maybe you do sometime. But ultimately, it it has to feel. It is so emotional. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that is, and people don't tell you that in the beginning. They're, they're telling you it is concrete. Oh, show them your numbers. Oh, show them your numbers. Show them your, show them your scale. You got this. Yeah, do that and have that, but it's emotional. Mm-hmm. And so learn to be a salesperson that can really dig into people's emotions. You, that's how, look at the, when we say these mediocre white dudes are, and, you know, are getting into where they're getting, that's because they're tapping into these emotions of these other white dudes. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I don't think the underrepresented founders are taught. Like, and I'm, that doesn't mean you have to sell yourself as a worse story, but that like rags, America loves good rags and riches. Mm-hmm. Another insight to the game that I'll tell people, the game of power is pleasing, appeasing, proving, and adapting. Mm-hmm. Pleasing, appeasing, proving, and adapting. That's the game of power. We're all, everybody's doing it, right? So from Congress to billionaires, everybody's pleasing each other. Everybody's appeasing each other. However, when you are an underrepresented founder who's gone through levels of personal trauma, his family trauma and challenges, you be you might say to yourself, like, Psh, I ain't about to be, <laughs> I ain't about to be pleasing them. I ain't nobody about to be. The game is though, they're all doing it. We're all doing it. And we know that it's the game. So we don't look at it as ego as offensive. It's like, oh, you 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 donated. You somebody asked you to donate. They know you coming back and asking them to donate, right? Mm-hmm. Like that. That's just the game. You um, you move in a certain way. You know, all of it's coming back. It's all a two way street. And I think the quicker that you kind of learn that and put some of the what feels may feel sometimes even slimy to the side and be like, okay, let me gather a different perspective on this. I need to move over here so I can move over here. One of my strategies is like. If you don't respect me, then I get respected by the people that you respect. <laughs> and and then you have no choice. You know, so, <laughs> so you got to get a little strategy in there, get a little savage about some of this and find your circle to cry because you will need that. But also, then you got to, like you said, jump back out there. And you got to be like, Psh, okay, we're going to move this like this. Move this. Mm-hmm. Chestnut checkers is real. Yeah. Like, it, it is a real thing. Yeah. You know, that's so that's so interesting that you say that because I think that especially in like uh minority communities, like there is such a um like um it feels like a necessity to present yourself as like the strong woman that you are. Um and I get that, I get it. And, you know, sometimes it feels like you don't want to like, you know, bend over backwards for someone or whatever because it feels like it goes against that like innate like strongness that you that you have as a woman but like sometimes like that is the way that it goes you know and it's I always have to like ground myself too in like does this help me get to where I want to go you know because like what's the alternative here and of course there's you know lines that you draw and and all that kind of stuff but um yeah it is it's it's about who you know it's about who you know um and at the end of the day like you know you can be the best business owner out there but like if you don't know the right people you're shouting into like an empty room 100 percent. and i think like first you discover um you know okay that the game is that you're gonna have to please some people mm-hmm. and then you discover that where the lines are you get really good at judging character to say like oh no this person's just using me because i think that's what people are afraid of they're afraid like i'm gonna get used i'm bending over backward for the wrong person and the only way to push through that to figure out who to bend over backward for and not that you have just using that language but like is to is to have to go through that a couple times where mm-hmm. you bend over backward for the wrong person and then mm-hmm. you go, oh, my God, what was the traits here? What were the mm-hmm. things that they said? What were the characteristics? Because these things repeat itself. The people who are bullshitting, they're not creative. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They they bullshit the same way. 
So if you can notice the bullshit quick, then you're like, you can kind of get through that. And radical softness, I think, is something that should be talked about. Like radical softness is a thing and it's a superpower in ways that I think that don't mean that you're like, you know, a pushover because that's the fear. I don't want to be a pushover. I don't want to be... You know, I don't want to uh, get taken advantage of. Like, that is not what softness means. Um, And I think that, like, you could really play having radical softness when you're moving in these rooms. I mean, with it ain't even a gender-based thing. I think that, like, people's belief in you is, like, if you have an understanding of, like, how to set boundaries and, and filter our bullshit and still be radically soft... And like that doesn't mean your silence. Like mm-hmm. you figured it out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um. All right. I have one last question. We talked a little bit about uh, social media and followings, and this question's a little bit of a hot topic. But do you think that everyone should publicize and post an opinion? about the Hamas and Israel conflict? Or do you think it's okay to just not not say anything? It's funny you said I was on a Karen Hunter show yesterday and we literally had this exact conversation because <laughs> I saw a comment on social media where somebody said, black people stay out of it. And so, you know, I asked uh, her and Drew, Drew McCaskill is over at uh, LinkedIn. And I said, what do y'all think about that? Like, should this be a moment where we're like, mm, I got to do it. You know, we usually the ones, but it ain't us this time. You know, like that is not fair. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, if you are not, because speaking out about this has repercussions, nobody, I don't not, I would say the average person does not want to be painted as anti-Semitic. Mm-hmm. I don't, and I, and I don't know that I, be, I don't believe that the average person is anti-Semitic, right? Mm-hmm. Like that is a, that is an extreme. Like, I believe that most people care about humans. Mm-hmm. Even the people, even even people who are Zionists, I still feel like they they care about humans too. Like, I feel like we all care about humans. That And, and maybe I'm like overly optimistic, but I do believe that. And I do, right? If you are, it's such a nuanced conversation. Mm-hmm. If you are not equipped, because if you notice, our celebrities ain't really saying nothing. Yeah. Now, usually they're the first ones to say something. But if you notice, then that the black celebrities, you know, I don't even know that I've seen any Hispanic uh, celebrity. Like, our underrepresented, like our, our black and brown folks, they're quiet on this one. Mm-hmm. And it's so nuanced, and if they say anything. So I think it is beneficial for some people to be quiet. Um, You know, I don't think people like Rashida Tlaib should be Censor. She's the only person yeah. in Congress representative of this area of the world, right? Like, hello, come on now. That's uh, for her to even be considered to be censored is, in my opinion, not American. Yeah. Um. So that's crazy to me. But I think that, like, broadly on social media, you just need to be you just need to be careful about what you have to say about this. And I err on the side of hum- humanity. You know, not yeah. choosing because this conflict, this conflict is biblical. Okay, yeah, like literally, you know, like so. <laughs> this is like <laughs> I'm kind of like, hey, you know, hey y'all, can we go? How can we figure this out? You know, like how can humans not be unaliving right now? Yeah, <laughs> like how can we? How can we just? How can we figure this out? Right, I don't want anybody killing anybody. That's where I am. But you know, it gets a little polar on social media. Yeah. Um, and on purpose, I think some people are using this for clickbait, and that's unfortunate. This is such yeah. a sensitive topic and a huge issue. For sure. But, for yeah. sure. Well, yeah. I mean, that's that's all the questions that I have for you today. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> well, that's perfect because that takes us right to the end of the show. Thank you so much, Kayla Casinetta, the visionary co founder. Do you say co founder or do you say, how do you do it? Just founder, yeah. Okay, founder of Agua Bonita. Make sure that you visit aguavenita.com. Go to the store locator and figure out where you can buy these amazing Mexican drinks. Um, and, you know, this is the Omi Show. We're going to be here every Sunday chopping it up with y'all. Make sure you get the book, Originate, Motivate, Innovate, Seven Steps of Building a Billion Dollar Network, wherever you buy your books. 
also on audio. So I, I don't think I say that all the time, but it's also on um, Audible. So make sure you check it out. And it's my voice reading the book. So you enjoy that. 